Welcome back to Fairycraft. Um, I have family over, so you might hear voices in the background. But so today we're going to talk about fairy etiquette, fairy beasts, and we might be able to get into symbols if we have time. So, fairy etiquette. Unfortunately, amidst the modern prevalence for quick fixes and doing whatever feels right in the modern magical community, the ancient rules of fairy etiquette, which are woven throughout our myths and folklore, have been much neglected. However, they are highly relevant and ignored at our peril. Iron. The prohibition against iron is well known, and there are a number of different theories as to its origins and reasoning. It has been suggested that it is man's use of iron and weapons bringing an end to the Bronze Age, which originally drove the fairy race beneath the hollow hills and beyond the veil. This may have some truth in it, but the simple fact is that iron has the power to hurt all spiritual creatures, not only fairy beings. This is why magicians use a sword containing iron to control summoned entities. It is considered extremely rude to carry iron tools or use them in fairy craft, and for this reason steel is to be avoided also. When cutting any plants or trees for fairy work, a sharp knife of bronze, stone, or bone is preferable, and this must also be with agreement of the spirit of the plant. There are several exercises within this book designed to strengthen connection to the point where communication of this sort should be possible with practice. There is, however, no need to be paranoid about iron consonant and metal to the extent you worry about belt buckles and underwired bras. Taking from sacred sites and trees. One of the chief causes of anger amongst the fairy realm against humanity is our propensity for taking without the thought of asking or giving fair exchange in return. This is another reason for working on connection and intuition before all else, so that we develop a strong sense of when a site or tree is sacred. Not all places that are sacred are marked in obvious ways, and certainly not those places that are sacred to fairy and beyond the kin of humanity. Permission must always be asked from the spirits of place before working on their land, and nothing must be taken from the area without explicit permission. There are well-documented accounts of, in folklore of ill-fated men cutting down fairy trees, usually thorns, or even taking branches from them and then being stricken with serious illness or even death. Moving sacred stones also elicits similar punishment. There was a man on the road between Chevy and Marble Hill, where there is a fairy plum stone that stands straight up and is about five feet in height. And the man was building a house and carried it away to put above his door. And from the time he brought it away, all his stock began to die, and whenever he went in or out day or night he was severely beaten. So at last he took the stone down and put it back where it was before, and from that time nothing has troubled him. That is from Visions and Beliefs in the West of Ireland. In fact, in November 2011, there was a report in an Irish newspaper of a wealthy man who lost all his fortune reputedly because he had removed an ancient burial mound from his land. The headline read, Sean Quinn's downfall is fairy's revenge, a clear sign that belief in ancient fairy lore is alive and well. Thinking. There is a curious piece of fairy lore that says we should never thank them for the things they do for us. This is seen in a number of tales, where being thanked or given payment of any kind results in the fairy leaving and never being seen again. It is my personal opinion that this is down to misunderstanding on both sides, and that simply giving thanks without following reciprocal action can be seen as being dismissive. We should indeed be grateful, but show our gratitude through continued cooperation and teamwork, rather than thanking and drawing the alliance to a close. Lying Lying is very simply unacceptable, to them, to ourselves, and to others. Equally important is the keeping of promises, as failure to keep a promise is a form of lying. Fairy beings will always know, and they will have no dealings with those who have the shadow of deception upon their heart. Offerings There are a number of important considerations to bear in mind concerning the very important area of offerings, and these are covered in great detail in Chapter 4, Honor. Eating Fairy Food Most people have heard the prohibition against consuming food or drink from the land of fairy, and it's right to be weary. It is important to spend many years working on connection and building up experience to then be able to judge when this particular rule may be broken. Fairy Beasts From a traditional Scottish ballad, She turned about her milk-white steed, And took Chu Thomas up behind, And aye when e'er her bridle rang, The seed flew swifter than the wind. There are a number of animals that seem to have special significance or connection to the fairy realm and its inhabitants. Often their appearance in our world heralds the presence of other fairy beings. Sometimes the beginning of an adventure into the fairy realm, or in some cases they may be fairy beings themselves in borrowed or shifted form. Often there is some distinctive physical characteristic that betrays their otherworldly natures. Often fairy beasts are either completely white, completely black, or white with a striking touch of red, such as the hounds of Anwen, who are bright white with blood-red ears. 
The colors black, white, and red are sacred to fairy. They are alchemical colors that, amongst other things, represent the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. The rivers of blood and tears that flow through the Celtic underworld, and the triple realms of upper world, underworld, and middle world. Horses. A majestic white horse, often bedecked with many bells, is the traditional seed of fairy queens. Horses are particularly associated with the Celtic goddess, goddesses Rhiannon, um, Epona, the Morrigan, and the Greek Hecate, who is sometimes depicted as having three animal heads upon one body, one of which is a horse. All of these goddesses may be considered to be queens of fairy, alongside many other titles in some cases. Horses are also the companions of fairy kings, of course. Manon and MacLear had a magical horse that could carry people over the waves and deep into his un otherworldly kingdom beneath the sea. Horses often appear as fairy beings in their own right, such as the Kelpie, a lethally dangerous and malicious spirit of water who drowns any who climb upon its back, and of course the beautiful symbol of spiritual perfection and purity, the unicorn. Folklore aside, horses are extremely intelligent and magically sensitive creatures, and will often act as guardians. The landscape of the British Isles is blessed by many chalk figures of horses carved into the landscape. They are of varying age, but some, such as the famous white horse at Uffington, have been shown to date back to the Bronze Age and possibly even further. These are truly sacred sites where the veil between worlds is thin, and may offer you a glimpse of a gleaming white mare dancing elusively in the dusk. Birds. Birds have long been associated with the fairy realm, most particularly blackbirds, such as ravens, crows, and of course blackbirds. In the Book of Invasions, um, Eochad, the son of the High King, receives a prophetic dream that predicts the arrival into, into Ireland of the Tutha de Danann in which he sees them as a flock of blackbirds. The shape-shifting goddess Morgan, who we have already noted as a fairy queen, is strongly associated with ravens and crows, often taking their form. The goddess Rhiannon, another fairy queen, was accompanied by blackbirds who had the power of enchanted song. As blackbirds can be heard singing in the liminal times of dawn and dusk, when fairy activity is most apparent, they are considered to be gatekeepers of the other world. Cows. Within fairy lore, there are both cows that are much as blah that are very much independent fairy beings in themselves, and those that are simply property. In the ancient tales of the children of Danu, the cattle raid of Cooley was a major campaign, caused by the trickery of the goddess Morgan. This extremely cow-oriented adventure also features the Morgan taking the form of a white heifer with red ears, and later on as an old woman milking a three-teated fairy cow. There are also many tales within more recent folklore of fairies taking the milk of cows, causing milk to sour, or making cows' udders dry up when they are wronged or denied in some way. Pigs. Pigs may seem an unlikely contender for the fairy kingdom, but herds of pigs are a regular feature in old Celtic tales. Mananen of the children of Danu owned a herd of pigs that could be slaughtered and eaten one night and returned to full health the next day. The Norse god Freyr, who was the king of Alfheim, rode a wild boar named um, Gullenbursti, who had the power to travel over earth, air, and sea. Myrdan Wilt, the mythical or possibly historical wild man of the woods, from whom the more well-known myth mythical figure of Merlin arose, counted a pig as one of his close friends of the forest, and famously addressed poetry to him. Insects. It seems obvious to point out that there is a close connection between certain insects and the fairy realm. Although there is not a great deal of lore to support this, fairies are often depicted as riding the backs of certain insects, particularly dragonflies, ladybirds, and butterflies. Although it would be easy to dismiss this as mere fancy and aesthetic license, and mostly a result of the flower fairy mentality, there is some truth to be found in this. To ride an animal of any kind is a term that can be used in witchcraft context to mean not literally physically riding, but to astrally ride alongside the spirit of the animal within its body. In my experience, fairy beings have an intimate relationship with all creatures of this land, which enables them to do this easily, and I believe this explains many instances of unusual behavior in animals and insects, particularly when guarding or protecting places of power and sacred sites. I have experienced this phenomenon a number of times with insects, particularly bees, wasps, butterflies, dragonflies, and damselflies. A lovely example occurred whilst in the final stages of working on this book. I had printed out the document, and my husband was reading it in the garden when a butterfly landed on the page and stayed there for some time. It landed precisely on a line of an interview with R.J. Stewart that appears later in the book, which states that fairies never appear with little butterfly wings. A sense of humor is so important when dealing with fairy. Dogs Dogs feature heavily in fairy lore, predominantly as the red-eared white hounds of the other world. Known as the the Quinn Anwen in Welsh tradition, they would accompany Arwen or Grapapnud on their hunts, or on Sowen night when the host would ride out, bringing fear to the land. 
The children of Danu and the Fomorians also had hounds. In fact, the name of the great hero of the children of Danu, Ku, um, I guess Kulain, means Hound of Kulain. There is a strong tra tradition of strange black dogs associated with fairy in England that is almost interchangeable with stories of ghosts and ill omens. The goddess Hecate is also associated with black dogs. They were sacrificed to her in ancient Greece at the crossroads, and in her triple animal-headed form she would often have the head of a dog. This may be seen to relate to her un underworld aspect as Hecate Chthonia, which logically would be the aspect most connected to the fairy realm. Much of the folklore connected to black dogs in England also connects them to the crossroads, generally the lost souls of hanged criminals. The wild relatives of dogs, wolves, and foxes also have strong connections with fairy lore worldwide. Foxes are particularly apparent in Chinese folklore in the form of shape-shifting femme fatales known as Huli Jing, and also in Japan where they are known as Kitsune. Deer Deer, both hinds and stags, are an important part of fairy lore. In Celtic myth, it is often a white stag or hind that leads the way to the other world or lures unsuspecting huntsmen. Fairy beings sometimes take the guise of deer, and fairy kings are often depicted as having the antlers of a stag. To be transformed into a deer for a span of time is also a punishment inflicted on mortals in a number of tales. Cats Catherine Briggs states that cats were almost fairies in themselves, and I'm sure most cat lovers would agree. They certainly have otherworldly qualities. There is also a tradition of fairy cats in Scotland known as Kate Sith, and a number of people have suggested that the the phantom big cat sometimes sighted on British moorland, such as the beast of um, Bodmin, may in fact be fairy cats. There is also increased reporting in recent years of shadow cats, which are cat-sized shadowy creatures that have been seen to pass through walls and into impossible spaces. These may well be a form of fairy being. Serpents in ancient um, chthonic symbols, serpents often arise in fairy lore. There are a number of beings who are described as being part serpent, such as the fairy bride Millicene. You may not realize it, but you see an image of Millicene every time you pass a Starbucks. Mythical Beasts There are a large number of mythical beasts associated with fairy, and we do not have room for an entire bestiary within this volume. Many of these may be encountered when working in the fairy realm either in journey, meditation, or other work in an altered state. Dragons, like fairy beings, are agents of the deepest powers of inner earth, and the elements, and they may be encountered in wild landscapes in high, rugged places where the primal power of the land may be felt. Unicorns, beautiful symbols of purity and spirit, are all also often seen in vision. So, in the next video, I will talk about symbols that are important to fairy, and then... We'll also go through the ritual for this chapter. And then we will be finished with chapter one.